lost everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me. Because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. Women on death row make up a small fraction of the total death row population in prisons today, less than 2%. From the early 70s, we've had almost 1,200 men executed and only 11 women. There's a general reluctance by juries to execute women. The thought of killing a woman, I think, is just not as palatable or as acceptable. And yet, occasionally, juries do impose the ultimate punishment on female killers. Women are typically viewed as nurturers. If they commit a violent crime that takes away from that identity or public perception, they may look more terrible or monstrous than a man. As a prosecutor, the goal is to try to convince the jury that the gender is not relevant. What's relevant is the facts and the law. A capital murder is a killing plus some other factors that make it worse. Killing two or three people, killing them through a torture, killing them during a robbery or a rape or a kidnapping. In some cases, geography can mean the difference between a life sentence and a death sentence. State to state, it's going to be handled quite differently, and quite frankly, even from prosecutor to prosecutor. In the modern era, the states that have executed the most women are Oklahoma, Florida, and Texas. Texas has been the death penalty capital of the United States for a long time. It was in Houston, Texas, that a brutal double homicide kept one woman on death row for almost 20 years. On the night of March 3, 1980, a frantic young woman flagged down a police patrol car and confessed to murder. I just wanted to admit to the crime. Pam said, me and Mike killed two bobs in Houston. She signed a 26-page confession. And I read how graphic her confession was. A hair on my neck stood up. 24-year-old Pam Perillo was one of three hitchhikers involved in the robbery and strangling deaths of two men. Mike held one end of the rope and told me to take the other end. The facts of the case were just so brutal. The state of Texas said she should die for her crimes. My confession is what got me the death penalty. What drove this young woman to commit such shocking acts of murder and then confess it all? This case would never have been solved if Pam had not given a confession. Pamela Lynn Perillo was born in 1955 and grew up near Los Angeles. She remembers her childhood as one that was scarred by abuse. My mother used to whip us with um, curtain rods and extension cords. My father started drinking and molesting me and my older sister. She'd been in like eight foster homes. Started using drugs when she was not even a teenager. By sixth grade, Pam dropped out of school and took to the streets. I used heroin every day. Did whatever we had to do to get the money. A lot of burglaries. She got pregnant at 22 and gave birth to a son, but continued her self-destructive lifestyle. I was working as a topless dancer. Pam met Linda and Michael Brittle when she was 24. Mike had been an inmate in San Quentin. News media claimed he was one of the most evil people that had ever lived. He was just one of those guys who enjoyed being a crook. Linda had met and married Mike while he was in prison. Mike was out on parole in early 1980, and the couple befriended Pam. Within weeks, Mike Brittle robbed one of Pam's customers at a topless bar. I was with Mike and another man when it happened. The ex-con and his wife, Linda, fled to Arizona to avoid arrest, and then called Pam to join them. The police was looking for us, and so I agreed to go. The three all got together, and they were basically hitchhiking across the country. We were all pretty much heroin addicts. Speed, PCP, all kinds of pills. The trio ended up in Houston, where they eventually met 30-year-old Robert Banks. Bob Banks had just moved to Houston. He happened to notice three hitchhikers on the 610 freeway. He asked us if we would help him move. Robert Banks hosted the three hitchhikers, even taking them out to a rodeo the next night. Every time he paid for something, he paid 
with a $100 bill. Riddle remarked at the rodeo, we got a pigeon here. We all started discussing that we were going to rob him. After the rodeo, a friend of Banks, 26-year-old Bob Skeens, showed up at the house. Bob Skeens arrived to help him finish his move, and they all kind of hang out together that night. The next morning, Banks and Skeens went out to get some coffee and some donuts. According to Pam, Mike decided to ambush the men when they returned with breakfast. Mike was in the closet, and when they came back, Mike came out and had a rifle told him to lay down on the floor. Banks didn't want to, and Mike hit him with the butt end of the rifle. Mike told Linda and I to go to the garage and find some rope. He had me and Linda tie Banks up. Then we took Bob Skeens to the other bedroom and tied him up. They started ransacking the house, looking for things to steal. The plan was take the money and leave. But Mike said that we couldn't leave them alive because they had seen us. Court records reveal two different versions of what happened next. And they decided to kill these two guys. They set Linda out to sit outside in the car. Mike put the rope around Robert Banks' neck. Mike gets on one end of the rope, and Pam gets on the other, and they simply pull on it till he dies. But Pam alleges that Linda was inside the home during the murders. Linda was in the back bedroom with Skeens. Mike put the rope around Banks' neck. He said, y'all are going to be a part of this, too. He told me to take the other end and pull. And then he called Linda out there and had her do the same. When you choke somebody to death, they don't die within a minute or two minutes. It takes about seven minutes for someone to die. Bob Skeens could hear Bob Banks being killed and knew he was going to be next. After Banks was murdered, Pam states that Mike told Linda to pack up the car. Pam stayed with Mike. When they get through killing him, they decide to eat the donuts and coffee the two guys had brought. The three killers then drove Skeens' car to Dallas and hopped a bus to Denver, where they pawned items stolen from Banks' house. I couldn't believe that what happened had just happened. Mike told me that he would never let me out of his sight after what we did. He threatened to kill me. On March 3rd, one week after the murders, Pam says she snuck out while Mike was sleeping to call police. As I was on the phone, Mike came out of the room. He tried to hit me over my head. She ran outside, flagged down a police car. Pam said me and Mike killed two bobs in Houston. I'm admitting to my part in all of this. She gave a 26-page graphic written confession admitting everything. Police kept Pam in custody and arrested Mike and Linda Brittle. The three perpetrators were sent back to Texas to face trial. That was a time in Texas when they were cranking out death penalties left and right. In Houston, we had a rising tide of murders. Presented with a 26-page confession, a jury convicted Perillo. My confession is what got me the death penalty. I was very young. I was scared. Linda Brittle never confessed to being part of the murders, and Pam's written confession did not implicate her. Linda hit the jackpot on that one. She should have at least gotten some years in the penitentiary. Michael Brittle went on trial in 1982. Linda's testimony against him sealed his fate. Pam spent three years on death row before a trial error got her sentence reversed. She would be prosecuted a second time in October of 1984. Robert Pelton was assigned to defend Pamela Perillo. When I met her, she was a frightened woman. She had already been sentenced to death once. She just felt real guilty. And she didn't, didn't have much of a desire to live. Jim Skelton, Linda's former attorney, was brought on to help with the case. In the first trial, they didn't bring anything out about her background. She had been abused as a child. There's no excuse for killing two people, but it explained it all. 
the prosecution compelled Linda Brittle to testify against Pam. Linda was turning state evidence on me and claiming not to even be in the house. She kept lying. Also damaging to Pam's defense were the crime scene photos. What happened to those two bobs was tragic. The photographs were something you couldn't even imagine. Pam's attorney pointed to Mike Brittle as the ringleader. Mike Brittle, he was a horrible human being. We wanted to paint a picture how Mike Brittle could take a middle-class girl like Linda to do all these things, and how much more easily it'd be to take someone like Pam who came from a tragic background. I always thought that Pam and Mike were kind of co-equal. You know, when the death penalty came back, I just really felt kind of sorry for her. She probably did deserve the death penalty. It's thought it was a really sad situation. Perilla was sent back to death row. Twice, she had executions scheduled. I didn't have a fear of death, but I had a fear of being strapped to that gurney. I kept going over my mind what I was going to say to the victim's families at my execution. Each time, she was granted a stay of execution. I came two days from my execution. I was walking into the visiting room to say goodbye to my family. The phone rang. It was my attorneys, and they said, the Fifth Circuit has just given you a stay. I was jumping up and down. The officer, she was jumping up and down with me. But a fellow death row inmate would not be saved. Carla Faye Tucker was my best friend for many, many years. We grew up on death row together. I learned what it was like to have a real sister. Tucker was executed in February of 1998. I got very angry at God when they executed Carla, and I threw my Bible away. I had to realize it wasn't God that took Carla. She was ready to meet him. I miss her a lot. In 1999, the courts again reversed Pam's death sentence. It was like this weight was just lifted off of me. They claim I had a conflict of interest because I had represented Linda in an earlier trial and took her on as a witness in Pam's trial. Perillo did not go to a third trial. My son told me, Mom, please don't take that chance again. She pled to a life sentence with the possibility of parole. Pam was finally off death row. I went 20 years on death row without being able to touch my son because death row inmates visit behind glass. Now I'm able to hold my grandbaby. I've grown up a lot in here. I just want my life to mean something, that my experiences would deter somebody in another direction. She'll never be able to make up for what she did, but she's trying to help people now. What we did was wrong. It's not anything that goes away or that I ever stop thinking about. I'll never be able to give back what I took, and I pay for that every day. How young is too young to be executed? For a long period of time, there was no line between uh, a, a juvenile and adult for the death penalty. The youngest woman given a death sentence in recent history was Paula Cooper in Indiana. Paula Cooper killed a nice little old lady down the street. She was 15 at the time of the crime, 16 when sentenced to death. Studies show that the most dangerous people in our society are the youngest people. They're immature, they're easily influenced by their peers, they don't have a set identity. Paula Cooper's death sentence in Indiana was eventually overturned due to her age. In Alabama, a young woman named Deborah Bracewell was not much older when she was sent to death row in 1978. Deborah Bracewell was only 17 at the time of the crime. I was young and I didn't know the law and didn't know nothing about anything. Just after her 18th birthday, she was sentenced to die by electric chair. I remember the judge told me about to stand up and then he sentenced me to death. She was the only female on Alabama's death row at the time. Women being sentenced to death is unusual. Girls being sentenced to death is just almost unheard of. I was in a single cell. Nobody talked to her. I was locked behind four locked doors. What manner of crime could compel a jury to send a teenager to death row? This was a heinous crime of murder. 
Whoever committed this crime was a cold-blooded killer. They not only fired point blank into the head of Rex Carnley, they fired multiple times after that. On an early summer morning in 1977, the body of 43-year-old Rex Carnley was found in a pool of his own blood at the gas and grocery store he owned in rural Alabama. Three months went by without police solving the crime, but on November 2nd, authorities caught a break. 27-year-old Charles Bracewell and his wife, 17-year-old Deborah, were in custody on unrelated theft charges. Investigators had reason to believe the two were also involved in the murder of Rex Carnley. A friend of the Bracewells uh, testified that Charles Bracewell said that because Mr. Carnley had been killed, they needed to get out of town quick. That's just a very incriminating statement. Police interrogated Charles and Deborah regularly while they were incarcerated. They questioned me like that 15 times a day. I told them over and over and over I didn't kill anyone. After three months, Charles confessed to the murder. Then detectives obtained a confession from Deborah as well. I told the sheriff I did not kill Rex Carter, and then he said, did you help Charles Bracewell kill Rex Carter? And I told him no. He said, well, Charles said you did. When she was interrogated by the police, she didn't have an attorney present. She was only 17 and mentally borderline retarded. Eventually, authorities walked away with a signed confession from the 17-year-old. They took a oral statement from her, and then they reduced that to writing and had her sign that statement. Deborah Bracewell and her husband, Charles, went to Rex Carnley's store to rob Carnley. According to Charles and Deborah's written confession statements, Rex Carnley let the couple into a store. Once inside, Charles pulled out a gun and demanded money. Deborah's statement said she grabbed Carnley's 22 gauge pistol from behind the store counter. She stepped up on a stool and shot Rex Carnley in the back of the head. Charles shot him eight more times in the face and head. Rex Carnley was brutally murdered during the course of a robbery when his billfold and $1,200 was taken. Deborah and her husband were both charged with the capital offense of an intentional killing during the course of a robbery. Deborah awaited her trial in jail without support or visits from her parents. Didn't understand why my parents wasn't coming to see me. I really felt lost and Deborah says she suffered a difficult childhood. I didn't have the best parent in the world, but I, I, the way I see it, they did the best they could with me. She was always smiling, sweet, and real shy. At the age of 13, her parents forced her to drop out of school to take care of her siblings. The childhood I had was not good at all. She was exposed to a lot of different things that shouldn't have been going on. There was abuse. Daddy used my mother as a prostitute, and I had to see all the other men come to the house, and I didn't like what I was seeing, so I stayed to myself. Desperate for any way out, the teenager ran away with an older man named Charles Bracewell. I had just turned 17, and he was nine years older than me. I wasn't attracted to him at all. I took him as an escape to get away from the house. Deborah claimed she didn't know about Charles's criminal activities. He would go places, but I never asked questions. But now the young woman found herself on trial for capital murder days after her 18th birthday. They had no other evidence really beside that confession. Without that confession, they would never have a case against me. Deborah denied knowingly signing the confession that was the key evidence against her. And they said, Deborah, won't you sign these papers? These is your release papers. I was so happy about getting out of that jail. I just thought I could trust the detectives, so I just signed the papers. She didn't start telling the story until the 1990s, 10 to 15 years after the crime. To confuse that with the release statement is far-fetched in my mind. 
She gave details of how it happened, what happened. Then you have a consistent confession from her husband. The confession had a tremendous weight in this case. I remember the judge, he asked me, did I have anything to say before he passed the verdict? And I told him, yes, I do. I would like to say I'm innocent. Then he sentenced me to death. I really didn't know what to think. I had just turned 18. I found out that she got the penalty from the family and from the papers. It was a terrible feeling. Back then, I was the only lady on death row. It wasn't a good feeling at all. It was tough. <laughs> the question about what is appropriate as far as an age to be sentenced to death is an interesting one. Today, the law is that a 17-year-old would not be put to death. The United States Supreme Court says anyone under age 18 should not be executed. There are cases in which kids do terrible kinds of things and probably deserve the death penalty. Nonetheless, the court has said they are not fully responsible for their behavior and therefore should not have full punishment. In 1981, Deborah's life was spared when the Alabama Supreme Court granted her a new trial due to the fact that she had been interrogated without representation at the age of 17. It all centered around the court's viewing of that confession and her age at the time. Her case was reversed. I was retried and I was found guilty again. Instead of them giving me the death penalty, they gave me life without parole. Deborah has spent 32 years incarcerated for a crime she was convicted of as a teenager. It was been lonesome. I look forward to having Christmas it's on the outside. I do feel that Deborah serves her time. I think she needs to have a little life of her own. Alabama society has said that she has not paid her debt. Will 32 years in prison make up for someone's life? I have to say no. It's an individual question based on what you believe is right and what you believe is wrong and what you believe is just. They do lock innocent people up. So I'm a living testimony of that. I was a 17 year old in jail, uneducated. They took advantage of me, that hurts. Deborah has embraced faith as a way to cope with living her entire adult life behind bars. Even though I'm in prison, it didn't turn out bad. I'm free on the inside, and that's what really counts, what you are on the inside. Not even a teenager. By sixth grade, Pam dropped out of school and took to the streets. I used heroin every day did whatever we had to do to get the money. A lot of burglaries. She got pregnant at 22 and gave birth to a son, but continued her self-destructive lifestyle. I was working as a topless dancer. Pam met Linda and Michael Brittle when she was 24. Mike had been an inmate in San Quentin. News media claimed he was one of the most evil people that had ever lived. He was just one of those guys who enjoyed being a crook. Linda had met and married Mike while he was in prison. Mike was out on parole in early 1980, and the couple befriended Pam. Within weeks, Mike was the ultimate punishment on female killers. Women are typically viewed as nurturers. If they commit a violent crime that takes away from that identity or public perception, they may look more terrible or monstrous than a man. As a prosecutor, the goal is to try to convince the jury that the gender is not relevant. What's relevant is the facts and the law. A capital murder is a killing plus some other factors that make it worse. Killing two or three people, killing them through a torture, killing them during a robbery or a rape or a kidnapping. In some cases, geography can mean the difference between a life sentence and a death sentence. 
state to state, it's going to be handled quite differently, and quite frankly, even from prosecutor to prosecutor. In the modern era, this. I've never wanted to die. I've never wanted to die. I lost everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me. Because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. Women on death row make up a small fraction of the total death row population in prisons today, less than 2%. From the early 70s, We've had almost 1,200 men executed and only 11 women. There's a general reluctance by juries to execute women. The thought of killing a woman, I think, is just not as palatable or as acceptable. And yet, occasionally, juries do impose... Acts of the case were just so brutal. The state of Texas said she should die for her crimes. My confession is what got me the death penalty. What drove this young woman to commit such shocking acts of murder and then confess it all? This case would never have been solved if Pam had not gave a confession. Pamela Lynn Perillo was born in 1955 and grew up near Los Angeles. She remembers her childhood as one that was scarred by abuse. My mother used to whip us with um, curtain rods and extension cords. My father started drinking and molesting me and my older sister. She'd been in like eight foster homes, started using drugs when she was not. States that have executed the most women are Oklahoma, Florida, and Texas. Texas has been the death penalty capital of the United States for a long time. It was in Houston, Texas, that a brutal double homicide kept one woman on death row for almost 20 years. On the night of March 3rd, 1980, a frantic young woman flagged down a police patrol car and confessed to murder. I just wanted to admit to the crime. Pam said, me and Mike killed two bobs in Houston. She signed a 26-page confession. And I read how graphic her confession was, a hair on my neck stood up. 24-year-old Pam Perillo was one of three hitchhikers involved in the robbery and strangling deaths of two men. Mike held one end of the rope and told me to take the other end. The 